Okay. Intermolecular forces, viscosity, surface tension, all this kind of stuff. What's going on here? We have a paper clip on like a beaker of water or something. We have a boat floating. Grace, are these due to surface tension? These phenomena? Assume so. To me, the only trick in rec oh, thank you. The only trick in recognizing which one is surface tension and which one is not is if the surface of the liquid is broken, it can't be surface tension holding it up. So the paper clip is the surface broken? No. Now the paper clip is heavier than water. It should sink, but it's being held up. Right? So there's some something holding it up. Surface tension is. It can't it's not heavy enough to break the surface of the liquid, of water. But the boat, no, it definitely broke the surface. So something else is holding the boat up. Sochi, what's holding the boat up? Mm. Here's a a little boat. There's another class I teach, physical science, and we do a lot more fun stuff than you guys get to do. We make little clay boats and things. And this is a boat that, that floats. Now, they had, they had to make these boats in the right shape, a shape that you can measure the volume of. And it's, it's a box. The length times width times height, they can get the volume. And they mass it. They get the mass. Divide the mass by the volume, Kathleen, and you get what? Density, right? So the density of this boat had better be what, Rebecca, if it's going to float in water? What's the density of water? One gram per mil. So the density of this boat, if it's going to float, had better be less than that, less than one gram per mil. And it is. Right? You divide the two, and it's less than one. It floats. So the same thing with that boat. That's why all these boats are hollow, right? To increase their volume. So you can divide their mass by their volume. If the mass is huge, divide it by the volume. Yeah, you get a number less than one. It'll float. Okay. So by the boat float. Now we have surface tension, though. Let's see if we can take a little closer look at it, Lewis. What are the units? for surface tension. A hint is in the table. Joules per, not mole squared, but meter squared. Joules per meter squared. Now a joule, Daisy, what was a joule? What was that used for? It's a unit of what? A joule. Where have we seen that before? We've seen kilojoules. It's a unit of Anybody help her? Yeah, heat. Energy in general, right? Because heat's a form of energy. Any energy, joule or kilojoule, right? Now, on the denominator, crystal is square meters. We have energy over square meters. What's square meters? Length times width, which is not bound. Area. So to me, this is what surface tension is. It's the energy it takes to stretch a liquid to increase its surface area by so much in square meters. So you stretch a liquid, right? How far you stretched it, divide that into how much energy it took to stretch it, that's surface tension. It takes energy to stretch a liquid. Okay. Some liquids takes more energy than others, right? Jessica, it looks like which compound has the highest surface tension? Which compound in there? Yeah. Water, right? Water, not hotter water, right? Okay. So... Why? Why would different liquids, Erica, have different surface tensions? Why? The 
Oh, man, she's using all the terminology, right? Did you hear the molecules, the intramolecular forces and stuff? Right. In human's terms, though, it's a liquid. Something has to be, these molecules got to be sticking together. Well, the degree to which they stick together, some are going to stick together better than others. That's all, right? They're intermolecular forces. Some are going to be stronger than others. So water must have really strong intermolecular forces, the strongest there. Okay. Viscosity. Amanda, what's viscosity? In, in Minnesota right now, now they're finally getting winter. Texas, you don't care about the oil in your car. You just want oil and change it once in a while. The viscosity of your oil, you don't really give a toot because it doesn't matter. Not so up north, especially now. Why? If you don't have the right oil in your car, it's not even going to start on a really cold day. It's thick. It's too thick. If you put in the wrong oil, it's so dang cold, that stuff is really, it makes, if you put in the wrong oil. So you have to put in a wet viscosity oil in the winter up north, a very low viscosity oil. They have all the weights and things on these oils, and that's, you got to know what you're doing, right? So you want a really low viscosity oil up north right now, especially Chicago. Otherwise, your car's going to get you. want that stuff to flip around in the engine and lubricate all the parts. Low, very low viscosity. Most liquids, try to stir them, Valerie. Right? What does it seem like to you? that The faster I stir it, it gets more or less viscous. Does it get easier to stir it the faster I go or more difficult? What do you imagine? Yeah, right? It gets easier the faster you get going here. Okay. Every liquid known to man pretty much is like that. Okay, so they call them Newtonians. They behave appropriately. But not all liquids do. If you take cornstarch and dump in some water, so dump in some cornstarch, dump in some water, you get something called a non-Newtonian fluid. In other words, the, hard, the faster you try stirring it, the more difficult it becomes. I can't even stir this stuff. I can go nice and slow. I can, you know, take this copper tube and put it in the non-Newtonian fluid really slowly, but try doing it hard. It won't go. So that's just cornstarch and water. So these guys, they filled a complete swimming pool full of this stuff, non-Newtonian fluid. All right. That's what that's what's in the swimming pool. Doesn't it look strange? It just looks like a strange liquid. <laughs> but the harder you push down on it, the more resistance it has. Yeah. Hey. 
Hey, once you stop moving, you sink like a rock. And then, and then they just play around with it some more. But okay. So all of this has to do with intermolecular forces. Jose, what does that mean? Intermolecular forces. I mean, the molecular part, I guess, it would mean molecule, but inter, not inside, but between, the forces between molecules. Intra, actually, is inside, but inter is the forces between. That's what we're interested in. That's what's going to control whether something has a high boiling point or not. If it's, if it's stuck really well together, man, it's not going to boil very easily at all. If it's stuck really well together, it's going to have high surface tension. Okay, can you name one of these, Grace, there's three of them, intermolecular forces. What's one of them? Dipole, dipole, that's right in the middle. Dipole, dipole. Okay, now, Sochi, what was a dipole? Yeah, and maybe this might help. You could also say, oh, this molecule's polar. The same thing. If this molecule is polar, it has a dipole. What does that mean? You hear? There's a negative end and a positive end on that molecule, and it's permanent. It's always there. There's a negative end and a positive end. Well, which end is the negative end? Do you remember how we figured this out, Kathleen? That's the big word, the E word. Ooh, you might remember this. Electro. You want to help her? Electronegativity, right? If there's this huge electronegativity difference, whatever that was, ooh, this molecule's polar. And how we figured it out, at least how I remember it, Becca, is which element up there is the most electronegative? That's how I remember this. F. So you put F with anything else. And it's going to be really, really polar, right? So an FO bond, polar, right? But really, this needs to be two different things, C and O. But one of them really needs to be somewhat electronegative, like close to the F, right? Like N and O or something like that. But what if I had F, F? In other words, that's the F2 molecule. Lewis, is that polar? F difluorine? Not polar. Why? He's right. It has two of them. They just what? They cancel out. They cancel out. So that's completely nonpolar. It's not dipole dipole. But yet you can have F two liquid, you just have to make it cold enough. So there must be another intermolecular force that causes F2 to be a liquid. It's not dipole-dipole, though. And we'll get to it in a little bit. Let's see a movie of this dipole-dipole stuff. Let's see. I don't know which one. That's hydrogen. Oh, you're getting all the answers here. That's not good. Okay. Forms between atoms with different electronegativities have a permanent dipole. That is, a separation of charges because of the unequal sharing of electrons. Some molecules which contain polar bonds do not have a net dipole. For example, carbon pentachloride has polar carbon chloride bonds, but the polarities cancel as a result of its symmetrical structure. They all cancel. A nonpolar molecule. Even though the chloroform molecule has a tetrahedral shape, one of the outer atoms is different from the others, so the molecule is not symmetrical. This means the bond dipoles do not cancel, and the molecule has an overall dipole moment. It is polar. Molecules such as sulfur dioxide have asymmetrical structures due to one or more unshared pairs of electrons on the central atom. 
Sulfur dioxide is an asymmetrical molecule with polar bonds. Therefore, it is a polar molecule. When polar molecules, such as sulfur dioxide, are close to one another, they tend to align so that the positive end of one molecule points towards the negative end of another molecule. Attractions among polar molecules are called dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so there's our dipole-dipole story. We need another one. So sometimes, even though you have, you know, these molecules like they had, you know, sometimes those, it's not that all these dipoles are going to cancel out. But when it's perfectly symmetric, then it's going to be nonpolar. You, gotta, you have to kind of be careful when you're picking out which intramolecular force is going on here. How about another one, Daisy? Ooh, now there's three names for this guy. There's Van der Waals, dispersion, and they all mean the same thing. London. I don't know, pick one. Call it London. I don't know. Dispersion. I will write them all down. So we Vanderwalls. The weakest. The weakest. Okay. Let's see if we can find a movie on it. Vanderwalls. Uh, we think it was that one. I think what's missing here is, what the heck is carbon dioxide? Oh, I can't write on here. Yeah, it's CO2, but what, if you did the whole Lewis dot structure thing, and you found all that structure, it's actually a linear molecule. This is what carbon dioxide looks like. So would this be a polar molecule? C and O, man, that's a polar bond. But they're going to what? They're going to cancel out. So this is completely nonpolar. But yet, you have, you can go to the HEB market, dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. You can get liquid carbon dioxide. This depends on what the temperature is. Something's got to be holding this stuff together. It's not dipole-dipole forces. It's this thing. These dispersion forces. Stuff just sticks to stuff. It's nature. It's really, really weak, but it's nature. Right? Stuff just sticks to stuff. But it's re just remember, it's really weak. So if you have non-polar stuff, it's always going to be this one. Right? Because it's the only force that will hold it together and make it a liquid. So Nonpolar compounds, it's always going to be dispersion force. It's just really weak. So these guys, these molecules that exhibit only, man, they're going to have really high or really low boiling point. What would you think? Really low because they're, they're held together so weakly. Okay. There's one left, Jessica, and it is Hydrogen bonding, yep, H bonding. Okay, now there's a trick to this one. Let's see if you can get it out of the movie. Some polar molecules have unusually strong intermolecular attractions called hydrogen bonding. These attractions occur in molecules where hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. The interaction occurs between the hydrogen of one molecule and an unshared electron pair on the more electronegative element in another molecule. The orientation of hydrogen fluoride and water molecules in the liquid states of these substances is determined by hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen atom in hydrogen fluoride is attracted to the fluorine atom on another hydrogen fluoride molecule. Water with two hydrogen atoms and two unshared pairs of electrons can form four hydrogen bonds per molecule. In ice, hydrogen bonding leads to a tetrahedral arrangement of water molecules around one another, forming six-membered rings that leave open channels through the ice structure.
In liquid water, the tetrahedral arrangement is not fixed because the molecules are able to move around. And on average, a water molecule is surrounded by 3.4 other water molecules. Hydrogen bonding forces are unusually strong attractions that occur among molecules in which hydrogen is bonded to a highly electronegative atom. Okay, let's see if you caught what they were, the trick to recognize hydrogen bonding. Now, it, it's, it is dipole-dipole. It's just a special case of it is all. And you recognize this special case when you have hydrogen and there are three elements. You have to have hydrogen in the molecule, and there's three other ones. And you can have any one of these three, and you're going to have hydrogen bonding. Fluorine was one, nitrogen, or oxygen. One of those. And then super strong dipoles, uh, they, don't want, they don't want you to call it dipole-dipole anymore because it's so strong. They want you to call it hydrogen bonding. Okay? So out of all those three, which one would have the highest? Ooh. Out of all those three, which one would have the highest enthalpy of vaporization? Out of those three different types of intermolecular forces, Erica, which type of intermolecular force would result in the highest enthalpy of vaporization? Hydrogen bond. And you have to kind of remember, oh, yeah, this is the energy it takes to make something boil, right? So to make something boil, you're going to have to put more energy in if it's held together really strongly in the first place. All right. Okay. Oh, before we move on, how is the strength of each type of intermolecular force increased? Okay, so Amanda, let's just start with hydrogen bonding. Okay. I'm trying to prepare you for the homework question. We have all these different molecules. All right, let's say there's three of them, and they all have hydrogen bonding in them. In other words, each molecule has an H and an O, N, or F. But one has a higher boiling point than the other. How do you tell? What's the, what could happen? Yeah. But looking at, this, looking at these molecules, anybody, it's a hard question. You have to really see what's happening here. One of these molecules is going to have more than one hydrogen bonding site. Right? It might have two O's on it. So then, oh, it has two hydrogen bonding sites. Oh, this guy might have three oxygens somewhere in there. He has three hydrogen bonding sites. Oh, this guy only has one O, one oxygen, or one nitrogen, or one fluorine. See what I'm saying? So that's the hydrogen bonding game. You look and see, oh, he has more hydrogen bonding sites than the other one, so he's going to be stronger. Do you recognize that? Make sense? So that's the game you're going to play if hydrogen bonding is going on. If it's dipole-dipole, all these molecules exhibit dipole all polar bonds. Valerie, how would you pick, oh, he's going to have the highest boiling point. Is what could be changing in all these molecules? They can have different strengths of polar bonds. How, can you, how do you recognize different strengths of polar bonds, different strengths of dipoles? Very close. We have to go back and remember how many months ago this was. You look up on the periodic table. Which element was the most electronegative? F. Right. So if you take F and something that's like F, oh, here, FO or FN, which one, right, both of these are polar. Ah, sorry. I'm trying to draw a little bonds there. Both of those are polar, right? Which one is more polar? Which one has a stronger dipole, FO or FN? Not FO. Why is it FN? Because the N is farther away. You have the most electronegative guy, F, and then N is farther away than O. The electronegativity difference is bigger for FN. That's the game you play for dipole-dipole. 
to see, oh, which guys are more polar? The farther apart they are, ah, they're more polar. Stronger dipole. Okay? So that's the game. We're, we'll, we'll go over it. We'll do some more homework on these. And then we'll do some problems. Now the London dispersion game. Now they gave you a whole bunch of molecules. There's no hydrogen bonding there. There's no dipole-dipole. There's no polar bonds there. How do you tell, oh, this guy has a higher boiling point than him, and all there is is van der Waals. What's your guide there? This is tough. Stuff sticks to stuff. Should bigger stuff stick better together than little stuff? Bigger stuff has a larger surface area, right? There's more room for it to stick. That's all you go by for this guy, his size. Now, how do you know if something's bigger or not? What do we call it? The molar, molar mass. Well, I'm sure guy has a bigger molar mass. He's bigger. Right? He'll have more dispersion forces. And actually, technically speaking, this is always going to happen because stuff sticks to stuff. It doesn't matter whether you have dipole, dipole, or hydrogen bond. You always have dispersion, but it's so weak, it doesn't really rule anything. Okay. It's all, you can't remove it, though. Okay. Intermolecular force acting below. In A, we have these HCl molecules, and they're supposed to, that dashed line is the intermolecular force. Jose, what type of intermolecular force is going on? Dipole, dipole. Right. How about Grace in B? What type of, in, we have two water molecules here. Dash line is intermolecular force. Hydrogen bonding. Now, technically it's dipole, dipole, but it's a special case of it. So that's why you're supposed to say hydrogen bonding. You have H with an O, N, or F. Okay. And in C, we've got this gecko Sochi stuck to glass. Yeah, that's what they thought at first until I read the, the article on it. They thought it was London forces. But if you dissect up these poor guys' little feet, you find out that there's water pores in there. So they, they think it's dispersion, yes, but probably a lot of hydrogen bonding going on, too. So I don't know how you'd know that, but that's, that's the answer. No, it's not going to come up on your quiz. So let's uh, practice going to the boards, and we can knock these out, and we'll be done. So there's chalk up here and erasers, and just write down your answers. Let's do this number one first. The heat of vaporization of certain liquids are, so they're giving us that delta H VAP thing. And liquid chlorine is 0.4, liquid hydrogen is 0.9, liquid nitrogen is 5.6. And all they want you to do is recognize why. Why is liquid chlorine, right? Liquid chlorine is the biggest. Why is liquid chlorine the biggest, and why is liquid hydrogen the smallest? Delta H fat. Whoa. Say it louder, Jose. Why is molar mass the answer? Well, they're close. They're diatomic. But the only force that's going on is the London forces, right? Because there's no dipole-dipole. Because remember, because they're the same thing. There's no hydrogen bonding. So that means the story has to be dispersion or London or van der Waals. And then, I forget who said it, but it's molar mass is the trick, right? Right have the highest molar mass? Yeah. And H2 has the smallest? So that's the answer. There's not really much to write for that one. Okay. Well, they want to know why. So the answer would probably be molar mass, so like someone said. The answer is really molar mass, because the only force that's going on is dispersion. Not really a whole lot to write there. 
Not a whole lot, really, to write on number two either, but see if we can... Oh, you can guess you can write the answer. How do you describe number two? Why is methanol the biggest? Why is oxygen next? And why is neon the weakest? For what, Lewis? For methanol. Hydrogen bonding has methanol, right? Methanol has hydrogen bonding. So remember, that's the strongest intramolecular force. So why is O2 then bigger than NE? Okay. Dipole, dipole? Be the mass. Now, can you rule out O2 and any? Can you rule out hydrogen bonding? Yes. yes. Can you rule? Can you rule it out? Any is just normal gas, just sitting there all by itself. So no dipole, dipole. There's nothing there with it. No, it's just any, just neon atom. But O2, can O2 have a dipole? Yeah. No, because it's the same thing twice. So it cancels out. So the only intermolecular force to look at for O2 and NE is London forces. So that means mass. So that means which one is the biggest? O2. So it should have a higher boiling point or enthalpy of vaporization than neon. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. No, you kind of got to look at them for a while. Let's try it some more. Hopefully there's something to write down now. Okay, now you can write this down on the board. Now you arrange, write down your answer. Arrange them in order of increasing magnitude of London force. Increasing strength of London forces. And remember the trick. The trick was what? Mass is the trick. Yep. Since they all have CL4s, really just need to go by, yeah, the first guy, the SI and the C and the GE. Yeah, uh, increasing. So out of S, I, C, and G, E, you guys find them on the periodic table? There, there they are. C, S, I, and G, E. So the lowest molar mass is going to be the, the carbon. All right, so the carbon one should be first. And then it's going to be the S, I one. Then it's going to be the germanium, the GE one. Right? So it's just molar mass. Make sense? Let's try this one. Halogen. We have BRC. I'll underline so it's easier to pick them out. IBR. There they are. They want to know which one has the lowest boiling point. So out of those compounds I underlined, which one has the lowest boiling point? The 
to try to identify the the type of intermolecular force that dominates, and then try to remember the trick of what you're supposed to do. Is that CL? Yeah. CLF. Well, that looks that's a weird looking L, isn't it? Yeah. CLF. Didn't really change anything. So what is the intermolecular that dominates? Which one would you guess? We're, we're getting there. Is it supposed to be activity idea, the dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, or dispersion? Which one should we be looking at? Well, it can't be hydrogen bonding. Now, dispersion's always there, but it's dipole-dipole because that dominates, right? Because dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding are the strongest. So if one of those is there, you forget about dispersion. So, But it's dipole-dipole, right? Because they're all different. So you figure out which one is the, they want the lowest boiling point, so you have to find which one is the weakest. Which one is the weakest? Okay. You've got Br and Cl. That's these two. You've got I and Br. That's those two. Br and F. That's this one and that one. And Cl and F. That's those two. Now only... I hear the F in the CL. Okay. F in the CL. Let's pick out now the BR and the F. Let's pick out this one first. Out of all of those, he's the only one where they're not the two boxes aren't touching. Right? The BR and the F. So this BRF intermolecular force is going to be stronger or weaker than the rest? It's going to be stronger, right? So definitely don't pick BRF, okay? Now let's look at the other guy. We had BRI or FCL, or these two. All right. Which one is more polar? Which one is the most electronegative? F. So you, what you want to kind of imagine, we don't have a table to calculate all this stuff. All we have is a little guide thinking, oh, F is the biggest. So FCL... F is a big number, right? So this is going to be more polar than this guy because F is the worst. F is the highest electronegativity. So BRI is really the answer, right? Because it's at least, it's polar, but it's the weakest polarity. Yeah, cause, because BR, because I, I is the least electronegative. Well, BR is the next least electronegative. So you connect those two, you'll have the weakest polar bond out of all those. That's the thinking that they want you to try to follow. Okay. Because they want lowest boiling point. Okay. Last one. Some kind of guide here. Those little, the blue, uh, the blue is carbon, the white is hydrogen. And the red is oxygen. Order of increasing boiling point. Which would have the lowest boiling point? Held together the weakest. Which one would you guess? D. Good. D. There's no hydrogen bonding. There's no... It's just... Right? And it's small. What would be next, probably? A looks like he's the next smallest, but you have an oxygen in there with hydrogen. So not A, because he's got hydrogen bonding going on. So first D, and then B, because B's just a little bit bigger. Right? Okay, so you have D and then B. Then what would you say? 
and then A, and then C. Why is C last? There's two hydrogen bonds. He's bigger, but that's really not why. The reason why is he has two hydrogen bonding sites. Right. B, B, A, C. Oh, that's the trick. So have a good weekend. <laughs>